Welcome to CNI Jerusalem Calling, your source for unfiltered Mideast radio talk. I'm your host, Faye Williams, and happy to be back with you. Our guest for today is Yuri Avneri, and we're so happy to have him. He's known as the Grand Master of the Israeli Peace Movement. Mr. Avneri is an Israeli writer and founder of the Gush Shalom Peace Movement. He has been working in this area. He sat in the Knesset from 1965 to 1974 and again 1979 to 1981. He was also the owner of an Israeli news magazine, which he can tell you a little more about. And, of course, uh, Mr. Ibneri, if you would also share your email with our listeners, I would appreciate that so that they can write to you and go on your email list. It's avneri at actcom.co.il. I want to start out with Mr. Netanyahu and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton hinted that peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians will begin soon. Do you see any truth in this? If so, do you think they will be productive? Well, Mr. Obama is putting immense pressure on Mahmoud Abbas to start so-called peace negotiations, while all the three sides, Mr. Obama, Mr. Netanyahu, and Mr. Abbas, all three know that these are sham negotiations, phony negotiations, which will lead nowhere, and which are only there to create a pretense that something is moving. Peace negotiations make only sense if it is agreed in advance that what we are talking about is the creation of the state of Palestine next to the state of Israel, and this, that these negotiations will be limited in time, and that while the negotiations are going on, settlements will not be enlarged. Because if settlements are going on while negotiations are going on, it means that, as a Palestinian friend put it, we are negotiating about the pizza, and in the meantime, Israel is eating the pizza. Negotiations are about creating a Palestinian state in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip. And if in the meantime more and more settlers are colonizing the West Bank, what are the negotiations about? Let's go to another subject. On Wednesday, the Israeli Supreme Court considered an application by a group of Israeli citizens to compel the Interior Ministry to register them as belonging to the Israeli nation. Would you explain for our listeners uh, the significance of the application and, and the outcome of that ruling? All Jews in Israel are registered by the Ministry of the Interior as belonging to the Jewish nation, because officially Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. Now, we believe that this definition is totally misleading and leading us in a wrong direction. Because Israel belongs to the citizens of Israel, as the United States of America belong to the citizens of the United States. By creating the fiction that the Jews all over the world are a nation and that the state of Israel belongs to that nation, we are creating unreal kind of reality. We give your listeners in New York and Brooklyn, who happen to be Jewish, the right to interfere into the affairs of Israel, to tell us what to do or not to do, instead of giving the right exclusively to the people of Israel who are Israeli citizens and who, who live here. So what we demand is to recognize that there is an Israeli nation and that we belong to it. The ministry refuses this. Actually, you can be registered in Israel as belonging to 260 different nations of your choice, except one nation, that is the Israeli nation. Right now we'll go direct to Roy. How are you? I'm good. And I wanted to say that you're you're one of my heroes. And I have a question. I understand that the Arab foreign ministers last week approved of Abbas's decision to resume the indirect negotiations and said that there should be a timetable, that the issues should be resolved within four months, or the issues would be referred to the U.N. Security Council. Would you comment on that, please? And would you say a few words about the meeting of the quartet later this month? That's my question. Okay. This Arab Committee of Foreign Ministers has just capitulated to American pressure, believe that these negotiations 
we lead anywhere, but they cannot say no to President Obama, who is exerting huge pressure on Egypt, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the other Arab countries, which are totally dependent on the United States. And therefore, they've come up with this kind of compromise, which says, okay, there shall be indirect negotiations, whatever that means, and they'll be limited to four months. Now, no one expects anything to happen within these four months because there's no pressure at all on the Netanyahu government to give in on, on anything. So the four months will pass, and then the Arabs will go to the United Nations. In the United Nations, there will be an American veto, and that's the end of it. It means absolutely nothing. For those of you who are just joining us, we're talking with Yuri Avneri, and you're listening to CNI Jerusalem Calling. Now, um, Dr. Avneri, recently Ziffy Levni stated the Netanyahu government was making Israel a pariah state. That's, you know, in regards to Israel's tarnishing uh, image internationally. Do you think her assessment is fair or just politics? Well, Israel's situation in world of public opinion is obviously deteriorating, especially since last year's war in the Gaza Strip. But this is not really causing much anxiety because in the foreseeable future it will not have any practical negative results for the government of Israel. It, it's not being translated into anything concrete. Actually, the Netanyahu government is worried about one thing only, and that is the relationship with the American administration. And they are assured that nothing bad is about to happen. When Mr. Obama was elected, there was a lot of anxiety in the right-wing circles in Israel that Mr. Obama, having been elected in such a big way, would start to exert real pressure on Israel to stop the settlements, at least. What actually happened was that Netanyahu stared him down, and Mr. Obama, the mighty president of the mighty United States, completely capitulated and withdrew his demand for a freeze of the settlements. At that moment, it was already decided that the American government is unable, is unable to put any pressure on Israel. Since then, the Israeli government has stopped to worry. They are a little bit uh, upset by small circuits here and there who oppose Israeli policy and declare all kinds of boycotts, but this is not really any reason for anxiety. Okay, Joe in New York, you're on, and would you speak slow for our guest? You spoke about a Jewish democracy, and in the United States here, we believe that Israel is justified in everything they do because they are a democracy. Now, the problem is Palestine. Israel, Palestine, it's divided. Now, the problem with the Palestinians, as I see it, is that they're losing more land every day, and the answer is a one-state solution. Do you um, think that's possible? Well, if you ask me about the one-state solution, my answer is there is no one-state solution. The one-state solution is an exercise in escapism. It is an empty slogan which has nothing to do with reality. A one-state solution will be an apartheid, a South African-style apartheid state, only much worse, because in this country at the moment, between the sea and the Jordan River, the historic country of Palestine, you have today a significant majority of Jewish people, but even more important, the personal income of an Israeli is about 15 times larger than the income of a Palestinian. There's a huge disproportion between the Jewish population and the Arab population, and living Living in one state would only mean a state completely dominated by the Jewish side, which will be settled all over the country, and there will be a creeping ethnic cleansing of the country because a lot of Palestinians in such a situation will emigrate. It's a totally misleading solution. What we need is to create a state of Palestine next to Israel. That is what the Palestinians want. 
the vast majority of Israelis want to live in an Israeli state, and the vast majority of the Palestinians want to live in a Palestinian state. That is a, a realistic solution. It is accepted by the whole world, and I don't see any reason to give it up. Those of you who are just joining us, we're talking to Yuri Abneri, and I'd like to go to another question, uh, Mr. Abneri. Uh, I know that there are many historical sites in your nation, and recently there's been some renovation going on with your historical sites. Would you tell us a little bit about those? Yes, that is another little step of spiritual annexation, I would say. There are a lot of places all over the country which uh, are considered holy by religious people. Many of them are holy both to Jews and to Muslims and also to Christians. The Israeli government has established a list of holy places which uh, are called Jewish heritage sites and uh, which are to be kept and improved by the Israeli government. Now, the whole the list is only about sites in Israel proper, in the Green Line. But at the last moment, under the influence of some right-wing religious parties, Mr. Netanyahu has included two sites which are in the occupied territories the so-called tomb of Rachel, Rachel in uh, near Bethlehem, and the so-called cave of Machpelah, cave of the patriarch in, in Hebron. Now, both these sites are holy to Muslims as much as to Jews. By including them in the list of Jewish heritage sites, they are, in a way, annexed to Israel. And yes. this has... This has caused widespread riots in, do, in these two places by, by Muslim youth. Hello, Dave from New Jersey. Hi, hello. I have a question. How come in Israel every time the criminals get elected and a criminal becomes the prime minister? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you see, what happened in Israel in the last 10 years is that there was a summit meeting in the year 2000 in which Ehud Barak of the Labour Party, so-called left-wing Labour Party, represented the state of Israel. And when he could not reach an agreement with Yasser Arafat, he came back and spread the idea that we have no partners for peace. The Arabs are rejecting everything which we propose. I've made wonderful, generous proposals, and the Palestinians have rejected everything. So we have no partner for peace. This slogan, we have no partner for peace, has become dominant in Israel and has destroyed the belief of uh, most Israelis that peace is possible. If you ask anyone in the street in Israel today, they will tell you, Okay, peace is wonderful. I wish there would be peace. I'm ready to pay the price for peace and give back the occupied territories and even East Jerusalem. But the Arabs don't want peace, so there will be no peace. We must be ready for a war which will go on forever, and there's no chance for peace. Now, with such a conviction spread by the, lead, by the leader of the Labour Party, the hope for peace has died. And if there's no hope for peace, there's no reason to vote for the Labour Party or for any other party which at least pretends to believe in peace. And people vote for right-wing parties which are committed to war, which are committed to ethnic cleansing, which are committed to settlement. And that is the unfortunate situation at this moment. We hope that this would change with the election of Mr. Obama in the United States, that the United States would put pressure on the Israeli government and the real peace negotiations would get going. Unfortunately, this has not happened. And at this moment, there is a kind of, I would say, an atmosphere of resignation, of having given up on peace. People don't speak about peace anymore in Israel. Well, that's really unfortunate, and we trust that as soon as uh, President Obama gets some things done domestically, he will turn his attention and inspiration to uh, peace with Israel and the Palestinians. Before we go to break, we'd like to go to David in West Virginia. Uh, for Mr. Abner, I have a question. You described the upcoming peace talks as a sham. Do you think there will ever be an Israeli government willing to give up the idea of greater Israel? I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe that such a government will come into being, but it will not fall from, from heaven. We have to do something about it. And the peace movement in Israel and all the friends of Israeli-Palestinian peace all over the world must act. 
together to effect a change. The change is not really a change of government. It's a change of public opinion in Israel. In Israel, like, like in the United States, if you want to change the government, you must change public opinion. You must get people to believe, to have hope in peace, to believe that peace is possible, to be ready to pay the price of peace. This will happen eventually because... You see, whatever happens, the basic reality of this country is that there are here two peoples, a Jewish people and an Arab people, who are going to stay. The Jewish people will not go away, and the Palestinian people will not go away. So, in the end, people will be fed up with this ongoing permanent war and reach for a compromise. The question is, what can we do about it? to make it come about as soon as possible and not have any more bloody wars in between. To go back to another question, uh, you addressed it somewhat, Mr. Abneri, on the uh, recently approved construction of the 600 settlement units in Jerusalem. What, what are most Israelis saying about this move? Well, I don't think they think about it very much. At this moment, the most important struggle is going on in East Jerusalem. Mr. Obama has agreed that Israel should freeze some of the settlement activities in the West Bank, but not in East Jerusalem. Mr. Obama has explicitly agreed that Israel continue to settle, to set, set up settlements in East Jerusalem. At this moment, this is the main battlefield. Actually, in, on Saturday, we are going to have a big demonstration in East Jerusalem against the setting up of these settlements. Jerusalem is a central part of any peace effort. It's absolutely clear to everyone on all, on all sides that peace is only possible if a Palestinian state will come into being with its capital in East Jerusalem. There is no Palestinian leader, no Arab leader, no Muslim leader anywhere in the world who would agree to make peace without East Jerusalem, Arab East Jerusalem, returning to the state of Palestine, returning to the Muslim and Arab world. We're talking with Mr. Yuri Avneri. And Mr. Avneri, you were making a point as we went to break. Would you uh, want to continue with that? Since the Israeli government is afraid that somewhere in the future there will be a pressure on the Israeli government to make peace, which would include returning East Jerusalem to the Palestinian people. They are accelerating the tempo of creating settlements there in order to prevent the possibility of East Jerusalem being given back to the Palestinians. This is one main reason for putting up settlements all over the area of East Jerusalem as quickly as possible, and we are demonstrating against it every week. Let me add one remark, which I think is very important for American listeners. All this settlement activity is actually being financed by the government of the United States. Why? Because all these settlements are being supported by American organizations which enjoy tax-exempt status. There are dozens and dozens of American associations, Jewish and non-Jewish, who support the settlements in Israel, collect money for them, send money to them, and are registered in the United States as charitable institutions which are exempt of American taxes. There are some American, some of our friends in America have alerted the American authorities to this uh, to no avail. The American government obviously knows about this and is closing its eyes. And in this way, a lot of the settlement enterprise in Israel is being financed by America. Yes. You know, and we're surprised that taxpayers don't know more about that. And uh, we get so concerned about what our tax dollars are used for, but that just hasn't aroused a lot of attention. Uh, we want to go now to Jim in San Diego, and then we'll come back and we want to talk about uh, J Street for a moment. Jim, how are you? I'm uh, very good, ma'am. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to find out from uh, your evening what he thinks the chances are of uh, a war with Iran. Will, will Israel initiate it, or will the U.S. Uh, via the pro-Israel lobby like AIPAC and similar? Okay. Did you understand the question, Ms. Dave Neri? 
No, I did not get it. Will you please repeat it? He was wondering about whether there would be a war between Israel and Iran, or would Israel initiate it, or do you think the United States would be um, initiating it? One thing should be quite clear. Israel has never made a war without the explicit or implicit agreement of the United States. Israel cannot make any war without the agreement of the United States. Therefore, if the United States wants Israel to attack Iran, then this is possible. Frankly, I don't quite believe in it, because there can be no Israeli war with Iran in which America will not be involved. What would happen would be a catastrophe for the world economy. The first thing the Iranians will do if attacked will, will be to close the Strait of Hormuz, which is uh, 20 miles wide, into which much of the oil of the world is flowing. Not just the oil of Iran, but also of Iraq and of Kuwait and of Saudi Arabia. It, it would be an immense thing. It would not be a small little operation concerning uh, some Israelis and some Iranians. It would be a worldwide conflict. What I think what is happening now is that the American administration is using Israel as a stick to threaten the Iranian regime, but my guess would be that nothing um, will happen on the military. Uh, okay. All right, I want to move to another subject now, and that's um, the subject of J Street and that uh, recent visit that was sponsored by J Street and Mr. Lieberman refusing to meet with them. And, of course, um, J Street is a pro-Israel, pro-peace organization that's criticized the Israeli government. I'm one who believes that um, if you've got a challenge with someone, then you need to meet and talk. But Mr. Lieberman refused to meet with even U.S. congressmen as long as J Street was present. Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, I'm all in favor of J Street. You don't invite me because I'm too radical for them. <laughs> but I think they're, good. they're doing a, a good job. I think it's very important for the future. Why is Mr. Obama so afraid to put any pressure on the Netanyahu government. One of the main reasons is there's a huge lobby called APAC, which pretends to be a lobby for Israel, but in reality is a lobby for right-wing Israel, for the most extreme right-wing policies of the present extremely right-wing Israeli government. So as long as APAC is the only spokesman for the Jewish people, I think it's a, it's a bad thing. Even if there's a small, much smaller Jewish lobby coming into being which would uh, support a different kind of Israel, a liberal, peace-loving kind of Israel, it is already a big improvement because people in the White House will be able to say, okay, there's APAC, which advocates a greater Israel, in fact, and supports the settlements and the, and, and the Netanyahu, but there's also another lobby smaller one, but still significant, which supports a different Israel, to which I would add that all those who consider themselves friends of Israel, and I hope that there will be many more, should ask themselves, what Israel am I supporting? Israel is not a monolithic state. It's not speaking in one voice. It's a very diverse society, and there is a strong element in Israel which wants peace, which, which wants a liberal democratic Israel, without occupied territories, without oppressing another people. And you can support Israel, and you can love Israel and support Israel, but this Israel, the Israel of the peace movement, the liberal, the liberal democratic Israel. We have the problem here in this country of many of our congressmen and others who simply will not criticize Israel and what it is doing publicly, but will privately talk about the challenges with Israel and, and, and the Palestinians and, you know, how, it, how the problem can be resolved if America would change its position. We are leaving you and we'll see you next week. We are leaving you and we'll see you next week. We 